This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, she is an elderly lady who has got this hypermature Morgagnian cataract. Let's try to go through this case. I'll be discussing about the technique of vertical chopping in free floating nucleus and what are the challenges we encounter and how do we deal with them. In a previous video, I had demonstrated that uh, how to prevent nucleus from torque when we're trying to do a horizontal chop. In this case, we'll try to address the issue like how to prevent the nucleus from undergoing torque when doing in vertical chop. The surgery is being done under topical anesthesia. So the capsule is stained and I'm injecting dispersive ovary into the eye. The main incision is created and the rexus is initiated. As expected, we are having this fluid cortex which comes out after puncturing the anterior capsule. Gentle irrigation with BSS is done to clear off the fluid and to ensure that the visualization is good. The chamber is again deepened with OVD. The rexus is reinitiated with the forceps and a decent sized and well centered rexus is created. Now we realize that in all Morgagnian cataracts, we don't have the epinuclear cushion as well as the cortex. So the nucleus will be free floating and uh, will be directly in contact with the posterior capsule. So that's the challenge here. Whenever we try to divide the nucleus, we are bound to exert pressure on the posterior capsule and also the risk of posterior capsule rupture or zonular damage during the surgery is going to be very high in such situations. This nucleus is also slightly denser. So my strategy in such cases always is going to create a slightly deeper trench. So the reason why torque happens when you're trying to divide the nucleus by doing a vertical chop is that we don't have access to the deeper part of the nucleus. If you can hold the nucleus quite well in the most central part, then by using a very sharp chopper, you can divide it with minimal induction of torque. To achieve a grasp in the central core of the nucleus, I need to create a small trench here which provides me that access. So to do sculpting, I'm going to use continuous high amount of energy so that it can shave off the central core of the nucleus without inducing any posterior stress on the bag or the zonules. The chopper does support the nucleus when I'm doing this trenching movement. The idea is to at least get 60% deep into the central core of the nucleus and then I would be shifting on to the chop mode. Point to note while sculpting is that the nucleus is never shooed away or pushed. The phaco energy which is used is quite powerful enough to just graze the surface of the nucleus but in the process eating away significant amount of the nuclear material. So we're going to achieve this small pit in the center of the nucleus without pushing the nucleus posteriorly. So that is the secret here. I feel the depth of the trench is good enough now to change out to the chop settings. Please note the, the settings. Using burst mode of longitudinal energy, the tip is buried into the substance of the nucleus going across the trench so that I can hold the deeper part of the nucleus. Once the entire shaft of the exposed tip is buried into the substance of the nucleus, the sharp tip of the vertical chopper goes down vertically and then the lateral separation maneuvers are started. My right hand with the phaco tip is actually lifting up the nucleus while the lateral separation maneuvers are being done. This ensures that the nucleus does not go and push posteriorly causing stress on the weak posterior capsule. So the right hand will be pulling the nucleus up while the left hand is going to do the lateral separation maneuvers. The chopper will be progressively placed in deeper planes to ensure that the posterior plate gets fractured with minimal amount of stress or energy being used. The nucleus is rotated and similar processes continued. After the first chop, there will be loosening of the grip. As we can see here, a short burst of phaco again ensures that the tip impales the nucleus firmly while the lateral separation maneuvers are being done with the chopper. All the fragments even after division are kept in the bag and this is in conscious effort. The reason is I want all the pieces to be in the bag itself because they act as a support system to the bag. If we remove few quadrants, it can increase the floppiness of the bag. So it's better to divide all the nucleus in C2 first and keep them all within the bag before aspirating them one by one. 
the process of division by using the vertical chop technique is continued. Again, the secret to deal with such cases is to ensure that we are going to hold the nucleus in the central part of the more posterior part of the nucleus. And then when we use the vertical chopper to divide the nucleus, we will not get much of a torque. I think there are two aspects to minimizing torque. Number one is to hold the nucleus in the central part or probably the more posterior part and then use a sharp vertical chopper which incises and goes in. So these two components ensure that we get minimal torque while dividing the nucleus even in such a free floating hard nucleus. I have got six small fragments which are divided and all of them are within the bag and I need to deal with them individually now. The settings change to the quadrant removal mode. Here I'll be using the torsional energy to aspirate these fragments. As I typically say that the plane of emulsification is going to be at the level of the rexus margin and my chopper on the left hand is going to act as a guard which is going to protect the nuclear fragments from coming out. And it's held in such a way that it is slightly above the level of the phaco tip and it's oblong and this creates a sort of a barrier and uh, ensures that none of these fragments fly out and hit the coin endothelium. The amount of energy which is delivered controls the amount of chatter and turbulence inside the eye. So we don't want any chatter or very minimal turbulence. And this energy delivery is controlled by the foot pedal. Time to deal with the cortex and in such cases there's hardly any cortex but few of the cortical fibers which will be there they'll be sticking onto the capsule and these sticky fibers indeed take a long time to aspirate because they'll be very sticking onto this flimsy capsule and uh, they don't come out easily. And there is this moment where in my attempt to remove the cortex, I end up catching the equator of the capsular bag and luckily I realize it early and pressing the reflex switch ensures that I disengage the equator of the capsule bag which was stuck in my aspiration port. At this moment, I realize that the posterior capsule is slightly ballooning anteriorly. It's almost like it's a dome shaped and its convexity is too much. This is probably because some amount of fluid misdirection has happened and is accumulated behind the posterior capsule in the burger space. That's the reason why I can see this some amount of positive pressure here. You can see when I try to blow the posterior capsule, you can see these ray folds radiating against uh, the injected BSS, uh, suggesting how taut the posterior capsule is actually. So I'm using viscoelastic to deepen the bag before putting the multi-piece lens into the eye. The lens is in the bag fine, but I realize that uh, the rexus needs to be trimmed a little bit. So I'm giving a tangential cut with a micro scissors using the side port and again using the same side port I'm going to do the enlargement of the capsule rexus. Time to remove the OVD both in front and behind the lens. Time to close, stromal hydration is done of the side ports and the main incision. That's it, the case is done. And these are the first day pictures. The corner looks all right. Very minimal edema is there. And she's doing fine. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.